Welcome everyone on behalf of the University of California. Thank you for tuning in to today's uh, webinar for the UC Alumni Career Network webinar. Uh, my name is Keith Ellis. I am a proud alum of UC Merced and UC Davis. <clears throat> and I serve as one of our alumni regents on the University of California Board of Regents. And it's a pleasure to represent you all in that space. I also serve as the alternate media design specialist at Folsom Lake College in the Center for Excellence, where I ensure students with disabilities can access their course content. <clears throat> And I am honored to moderate today's uh, webinar. This program is part of a UC wide effort uh, to unite and support alumni across our 10 campuses. We aim to equip you with uh, information and insights and, connect and connections necessary uh, to launch, grow, and expand your career. Throughout today's uh, session, you will be able to um, have, you will have the opportunity to ask questions using the Q&A uh, feature at the bottom of your screen. Our discussion topic for today's session is focused on being a seasoned uh, seasoned professional in a new workplace. Our panel will uh, share professional experiences and insights along with tangible tips and advice uh, to help you find, build, and create community in your new workplace and leverage working in an age diverse workplace. Uh, for me personally, um, while I have pretty much been with the same employer, uh, the Los Rios Community College District, uh, for about nine years in that time span, I have shifted uh, college campuses. And much like the UC, each campus is kind of unique. And um, for me, um, you know, switching campuses, I want to leverage my experience but also be mindful and not you know disenfranchise my new co-workers by keep referencing you know my previous campus and saying things will like well back at such and such place you know you don't want to build those feelings of um uh well, you know with your co-workers well if he liked it so much over there why don't you go back there kind of a thing um but i am um joined today with three inspiring uc alum and staff uh, first off with um, Jay Westrod, who graduated, um, who is a graduate of UC Davis in economics and history and serves uh, as um, a Cal Aggie Alumni Association board member. Uh, he recently retired, so he's got a wealth of experience of over 34 years of career experience in um, real estate and uh, financing and management, most recently having uh, work uh, in the area of managing of uh, fairway independent, in independent mortgage. Over Jay's career, he has uh, hired and managed thousands and thousands of employees he has been uh, responsible uh, for business growth throughout uh, the development and uh, implementation of innovative uh, marketing, training, and communication programs, processes. Um, so thank you, Jay. And then also we have Adrian um, Rimaldi has uh, worked in uh, staffing and recruitment uh, for about 10 years. Uh, in this uh, time, uh, she has partnered with a wide range of businesses uh, throughout 
uh, the Yolo, Solano, and Sacramento counties uh, to assist with finding uh, solutions to their various staffing and needs. She has developed large scale staffing um, programs as well as uh, conducted headhunting services for high high level and um, specialized positions. And for the past three years, uh, Adrian has worked with UC Davis uh, with temporary employment services, a department at the university that provides uh, temporary staffing solutions for uh, various uh, units at UC Davis and UC Davis Health Systems. Uh, and then, of course, we have uh, last, but certainly not least, we have Tracy Wilson, who is uh, the marketing and communications coordinator at UC Irvine Alumni Association. Uh, she is a seasoned uh, marketing professional with 30 years of industry experience uh, in educational and business. Uh, consumer and software marketing, uh, public relations, advertising, and uh, entrepreneurship and the like. And, oh, and engages uh, over 220, oh, can't read, <laughs> engages 227,000 UCI alumni with opportunities for professional growth and ways to uh, spread uh, the anteater pride. Uh, Tracy is currently sharing her knowledge uh, to innovate uh, processes, collaborate uh, across campus and bring uh, fresh ideas to engage alumni. So thank you, Jay, Adrian, and Tracy. Um, for joining us and giving up your time. And let's dive into our first question. And so we'll just start with uh, Jay, and then we'll kind of go round robin um, with our conversation. Um, so what is your um, journey and kind of what brings you to us today and kind of give you a little bit more insight into your background? Uh, uh, start off with a conversation with just a quick introduction uh, by each of you about uh, your role and why this topic is is important to you. Well, thanks, Keith. I'm happy to be here and welcome everybody who's on this webinar. Um, I think you did a pretty good job of describing, and I don't. This isn't really about my career or anything like that. This is about just uh, discussing different. Uh, best practices, I guess you could say, in terms of how to navigate through this ever-changing uh, work environment. Um, why am I here? Um, I, quite frankly, have always kind of taken a personal um, desire to help others. And I feel if there's any kinds of information that I can add that might even help just one person on this call, then it was worth it. And so certainly I don't have all the answers, but I can certainly give you all my insight, my perspectives and the things that over my career that I've seen that have been very successful for myself and those employees that I've worked with. And sometimes things that were done or said or whatever that weren't as successful. So, you know, with that, I, I, I'm looking forward to the questions that, that we uh, have to address. And hopefully, again, we can help some folks out here. And then we'll jump over to you, Adrian. Hello, everyone. Um, first, I'd just like to say I'm really honored to be here. Um, and I would like to um, kind of repeat what Jay said. Uh, aside from the fact this is what I do for a living, I work with um, applicants, candidates, and employers all day long. Um, the reason why I do it and what gets me up, uh, <laughs> gets me in the in the office every morning is, is when I see these things play out successfully, um, you know, in the lives of, of the folks that we work with, um, even if it's just one person, maybe I'm able to provide um, 
some sort of a advice or a tick or, or a tip or trick that they haven't tried with their application or their interview or the resume. And, and maybe that's that that's the smoking bullet that gets them gets them the job. Um, I just love to be a part of the process. I love to see people grow. Um, and I like to help out however I can. Um, again, a, a lot of the suggestions that I have or tips I have are based off of experience, either from myself, candidates I've worked with or, or hiring managers that I've worked with. And um, so um, I just, if, if I can say something today that helps one person land their next, their next opportunity, then, um, then that's a success for me. Thank you so much. Thank you. And then Tracy. Um, well, thank you, Keith. Um, I was very excited to be a part of this today because I had a, a truly positive experience in my transition into the Alumni Association at UCI. And I thought being able to share some of that experience in addition to just a taste of what my background is could be helpful to others as they're kind of trying to that same type of uh, perspective together so that they can talk to employers and talk to um, uh, potential new coworkers uh, about uh, what they're doing. Um, I started my career in marketing and PR for an educational software company. Anybody remember Oregon Trail? <laughs> that was it. <laughs> and <laughs> yes, and then uh, moved to Silicon Valley and worked with a number of startups in marketing roles before settling in Orange County and working with a marketing company with clients in hospitality and medical. Um, but I really chose to come to uh, at least approach the UCI Alumni Association and was grateful that they um, engaged me as well um, after leaving the marketing company, but really because I wanted to be, be a part of a mission that I believed in and wanted to take the experiences that I had in all these various backgrounds and industries and try to solve the problems that they were trying to solve and and get to the next level that they were looking to to get to so it was it was exciting because both my husband and my family we've all been involved in education in some capacity and so just being able to contribute into that mission and um quite frankly they welcomed this you know golden gopher j school alum as their newest anteater too so <laughs> that was awesome <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah, that you were part of that. I think a lot of us who are school age in the 90s who played Oregon Trail really, really have fond memories, uh, Tracy. So thank you for sharing. Uh, I'm going to go to our next question, start off with you, Adrian. But our first question or second question, rather, is how do you uh, create community in a new workplace and leverage uh, working in an age diverse workplace? force or workplace. So Adrian, let me lead us off. That's a tough one. So how do I leverage? Let's see. Um, well, I think there's a, when you're, in, when you're a brand new employee in a new workplace, um, you know, there's, um, I want to kind of piggyback on something that, that I think Jay or, or even you had mentioned earlier. Um, we know we, how folks often reference their previous roles, right? Oh, well, this is how we did this here. This is how we did this here. And in, and from, uh, the perspective of a new employer, I think they're probably repeating in their head, but that's not how we do it here. <laughs> that's not how we do it here. I think oftentimes as new employees, um, you know, especially if we're if we're transferring into a role that maybe isn't just like what we just left, oftentimes we try to make um, we try to translate. You know, what have I done? What I did before, and what you're training me to do now. And sometimes that can come across as this is how we did this at my old place. Um, and and that in itself can create some some conflict. So. Um, uh, that's one phrase that you probably want to stay away from. Um, you can trans do the translation in your head, but you might not want to, to communicate it to a new employer. Um, as far as building community in a new workplace, there's a lot of different ways. And um, within the UC system, there are um, a lot of different social groups that you can participate in. Um, it could be as simple as, um, you know, there's you have your social groups, your wellness committees, your DEI committees. There's a, lot, a wide range of things that you can participate in. Um, and if you are working in an office, the easiest thing you can do is eat lunch in the break room. 
Um, that was something that was advised uh, to me in my last role when I was working with development and alumni relations. There were a lot of development officers, and I mean, it was just a huge, um, a huge unit. And the hiring manager said to me, this is a great way for you um, to build relationships with people that you might not see or, or interact with on a regular basis, have lunch in the break room. And, um, and I, I tried it a few times and lo and behold, I was uh, meeting people, having coffee, having our snacks and talking about, you know, the weather or, or little things that led to lunch dates or that led to, you know, um, building those, those relationships, whether they were directly related to your work or just networking type relationships within the workplace. And, and it helped me feel a lot more comfortable because I had other people that I knew and other people who, who liked to communicate with me and who made me feel comfortable. Um, so that's a big one. Um, you know, these are, and as you're interacting with these people, you can ask them about, you know, do you participate in any networking events or any social social committees or anything like that. Um, it, I think a lot of it is just asking around and taking full advantage of, of the different things that are available, trying those things. Um, you don't necessarily have to commit because they might not be the best fit for everyone after you've tried them out a few times, but, um, but just trying uh, your hand at, at, at some of these uh, supplement supplemental type activities, I think can definitely help you build relationships um, with within within your new um, employer. Um, and then they, they just kind of take off from there. You know, next thing you know, you have a group of folks who are, are your references and your network and they're building you up and they're referring you. Um, you know, it's, it's just small little steps. Um, starting out is just introducing yourself. I'm new here and ask a question or just let them know you're new. <laughs> the conversations and the relationships will kind of evolve from there. That's fantastic. Yeah, I totally agree with, you know, don't, don't eat in your cubicle, don't eat in your office, go, go eat somewhere else. I personally, I'll, on a nice day, I'll go eat out on, in the quad mm -hmm. at a table, you I know, that kind of thing. Yeah, our natural inclination, I think for a lot of people, different personality types, but for a lot of people, for myself is to go and hide because I don't know anybody. And that's the, you want to do the complete opposite, put yourself out there and don't be afraid to do so. Totally agree. Uh, what about you, Tracy? How do you build community in a new work workspace, workplace? Um, it, it's actually been quite fun. Um, this team is is pretty spectacular in um, their their diversity of both uh, experiences, uh, culinary uh, adventures that they like to go on. Uh, I'm a big foodie, so um, I, I think what's been most exciting is. I've approached it as this is an exciting opportunity to get to know a lot of different people at a lot of different points in their career and ask them questions and find out how they did specific things to get where they um, where they wanted to go, but also learn from that and figure out how I can connect some of my lessons um, and experiences, good and bad, um, to whatever they're personally trying to do or whatever is actually happening within the group. Um, and like um, uh, Adrian said, and you've said too, eating uh, alone, uh, unless you are absolutely on deadline, <laughs> go for the lunch bunch. We have a lunch bunch um, every uh, time we as a group are meeting live and in person. We do a lot of virtual meetings still, but um, when we are there, um, we always find a way to um, just take that hour and go chat with people. Um, and also one of the things that um, when I first started only a year ago um, that I got involved in was a campus-wide uh, wonderful round table. And what it does is it meets uh, quarterly and brings together people from uh, all different departments and groups across campus. So it's it's a hour and a half opportunity to dive into what's happening in everybody else's world. And through just that conversation, listening, I've been able to say, hey, you know what, we'd love to feature this alumni that you're talking about in our um, next newsletter or in, you know, our uh, on our socials or, or some way to connect and bring everyone together. Um, and I do have to say that um, the other thing that's been fun too is that we've all been sharing so much uh, about 
uh, what are our favorite places to eat? And so we actually created on Yelp uh, a specific uh, alumni association account where everybody can add in their favorite vetted uh, restaurants, uh, you know, from across the globe. So it's great if you're in a totally different part of the country or world or even just the, you know, different city, you can know that you're going to find a great lunch. So that's part of the way that I like to leverage um, and, and encourage um, excitement and diversity. That's so awesome. Definitely build community around food. Uh, so Jay, uh, across your expansive uh, uh, experience and time, uh, how have you built uh, community in your new workplaces as you've moved throughout your career? Sure. And, and so, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've got a little bit different perspective being on kind of the senior management side, but I think a lot of these <clears throat> items that I'm going to bring up right now are, are, are certainly applicable for everyone. And I also want to point out that I know things have changed in the work environment where we've got not just folks traditionally working in an office all the time, we've got hybrid and we've got full remote. So I, I think these some of these uh, tactics in terms of building community that I'm about to talk about, I think could apply to all of them. Um, number one is <laughs> I've always strived to make it fun. I mean, we spend so much time, we spend more time working than we do anything else, right? And it's stressful. I, 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 <laughs> there's demands, there's deadlines, there's tough, you know, tough coworkers or tough supervisors that are really hard to sometimes deal with. And, but there's ways to make it fun. And I, I think that's how you build a community is one to take a positive approach to spending so much time of your life doing something. And so some of the, some of the specific items that I, I incorporated were, and anybody can do this at any level, is uh, have, I had a weekly meeting and um, without fail, it was every Monday morning. And what, what, what it, whether you're working remote, hybrid or together, and it's obviously nicer if, you're, if, if, if everybody's together where you can be you know, there face to face, but even if you can, that's fine. But in those, they're not long meetings because I know pe I hated meetings. And but it was just a quick little down, you know, download of hey, tell us something great that happened over the weekend, and what are you grateful for? We ended up calling it like a gratitude circle, and people would just. I was grateful that I was able to get my kids to school today on time. You know, it could have been something as simple as that, but it it, it wasn't about work. It was just about finding out about others within your working cohort and it really did build community that way. Cause it's like, oh, I didn't know you have kids. How old are your kids? And, or whatever the case may be. Um, so, so that was one of the things I, I highly stress having meetings again, not put a time, we put a time limit on of 15 minutes. So everybody knew it was in and out, but it was, and it wasn't about work. It was about having, it was about our lives and it was about something personal usually, but it was always positive because of something we're grateful for. Um, and, and so that was number, that was one of the things also learning from from folks within your work environment. Um, I, I I'll, I'll call myself out. I'm a boomer, and I thought I was good at tech, and I'm not. And uh, you know, so I, I would I would be struggling on something, and I, you know, I finally learned to be humble towards the latter part of my career and ask one of the newer employees who I knew was tech savvy to help me. And I felt like an idiot sometimes <laughs> asking for help on a, on an Excel spreadsheet or whatever it was that I should have known, but just FYI folks that are younger on this call, they didn't have Excel when I was in college. But um, anyway, uh, my point is, is, <laughs> is to ask for help. And everybody at any phase of their life has certain strengths that you may not. And again, it's a little part of being, I think, you, you know, humble, having a little humility and not being, it's okay to ask questions. Um, so, yeah, I, 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 I will stress that I do think in terms of building community, it's a lot easier to do it if you're if you are in a position to be there face to face with somebody. Um, you, you just it's hard to it's hard to really gather a, sometimes the, the the unspoken words on a Zoom call or, you know, just the mannerisms, the the gestures and, and whatnot. And so if you have an opportunity to spend any time within a work environment, and I, you know, you know, I know there's a lot of folks probably in tech, and that's that's a remote job. I get it, um, but maybe recommend to whoever your supervisor is that they put together something on a quarterly basis. You know, that was mentioned earlier, something like that. There's a lot of things you can do, um, I think, to 
to create a situation where you can somehow get your the base with some folks. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Um, I think it's kind of counterintuitive sometimes to be a little vulnerable in the workplace. We don't want to expose that, uh, especially to, to, to like our boss. Uh, but I think it, it's it's good to like show a little vulnerability. That's kind of how you kind of kind of can build connection there. Uh, Jay, you kind of touched on this a little bit that the evolving landscape. So I kind of want to um, reach back to a question we got from Joanna in the chat uh, and kind of pitch it to to Adrian and Tracy about how can we build uh, community in this new evolving maybe 100% remote or some variation of hybrid and remote, you know, in-person and remote. Um, so I'll kind of start with you, Adrian, in terms of like, how do we be a little more intentional uh, with our, our building community given our new new paradigm? Um, well, first of first, whenever you're invited to a Zoom call, make sure your camera's on. Um, it really does help to see people's faces, even if we're doing a Zoom call or a Teams call. Um, if you can't be there in person, um, to, to, it, it really helps to have, you know, that, that face-to-face -face interaction. Um, I actually have a, a, a team of six struck reports and, and we, um, we do work remote for the majority of the time we, we go, we frequent the office, um, for, uh, group trainings. That was something that I, um, to Jay's point, that was something that, um, I think that we needed. Um, I did find that um, if folks are able to connect on a more personal level, it, it, it can absolutely supplement their, their work relationships as well. Um, so in our meetings, we do things like we, we have a bunch of icebreakers. We did two truths and a lie and, and we got to learn about each other, you know, based on um, what the actual truth was uh, in the icebreaker. And, oh, so this is the truth. Tell us more about that. And then the person would explain, we get to know our coworker. Um, that way we've done some strengths builders activities um, where folks find out what their strengths are. And then they get to, you know, um, they get to collaborate together on how they have the same strength, but they're different. You know, these are things that, that can be organized by a supervisor. But if you, the employee, don't have a supervisor who is organizing these things on behalf of the team and giving you opportunities to, to, um, to communicate, um, I, I do want to go back to Jay's point about asking for help and showing vulnerability. Um, when you're a new employee in a new workplace, especially if you have a lot of really great experience that can be very intimidating for those that you're joining, and uh, it humanizes you to show a little vulnerability. Um, I think one thing that has helped me be successful in the roles that I've been in is I am not afraid to say, help me, I'm new, or can you please help me, I'm new. And if you're not the right person, do you know who it would be? And, um, and if they are the right person and you're asking them for help in an area that they specialize in, people love to tell you everything they know. And so that in itself kind of helps kick the relationship off on a good, on, on the right foot, because they're having an opportunity to showcase their knowledge, skills, and abilities to a brand new employee who may have intimidated them initially because they didn't know what to expect when you walked in the door. Um, so asking for help, I think is going to be a huge way to build relationships. And, and if that's, and, and when you get the, sure, I have time to help you on this day and time, do a Zoom call, put your camera on, you know, don't be afraid to be yourself because that's what's going to help you build that relationship with the person through the virtual space. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, Tracy, before we move on to our next question, do you have anything you want to add on? Yes, I would say uh, definitely be uh, be vulnerable, but also be curious and um, just ask those questions uh, and be willing to um, to just really kind of understand where they're coming from. And also, um, we as a team did uh, strength builders just recently, um, and we did this was exciting a a team building exercise on the ropes course. Oh yes. Yes, I did that. <laughs> but it was, I it was it. Was, I think the telling thing was that the team members who were leading it, who do this for groups across the campus, said, "You are the only group that has been thoroughly excited and has worked 
so closely as a team to achieve all of these goals. So basically none of us really fell apart and no one fell either. <laughs> so um, I would say any of those types of group exercises or, or team building things, um, including uh, even if you have students, I manage a few students um, and we always try to uh, have quick Zoom meetings or, or Teams meetings and always have that connection. And even when you're um, also trying to connect with, uh, say, another team member, if they're having a challenge or they're asking you some type of a question that you are uh, an expert in, definitely just take an extra five minutes and say, can I come over to your office? Or how about we set up a quick call or a Zoom and let me walk you through it and, and it, help them understand how to walk through it but also that builds that connection and trust and a different level of understanding. And again, kind of reiterating to the bigger picture and, and the mission for what everyone is really there to do. Yeah, I would totally agree. Um, I think while maybe the work itself can be done 100% remotely, maybe uh, to really build community, there's no substitute for, for in-person, but I think there are ways where you can still kind of leverage the technology we have with Zooms and whatnot uh, to still kind of connect here and there. But, uh, you know, in-person, I'm an in-person, I like in-person. <laughs> but uh, going to our next question um, is for you, Tracy. Uh, as a new hire, uh, what are uh, some ways uh, to take uh, your past experience and get buy-in uh, from new coworkers or colleagues in order to implement change or inspire innovation? I would say um, something that I mentioned before, but it's really listen. Um, take the time to listen to what your colleagues and your coworkers are saying and ask the questions, be curious. Um, I like to put on my uh, journalism hat and you know be that reporter and kind of try to delve into why things are happening the way that they are and ask the questions and be as responsive as possible um, and, and really try to connect without, um, oh, well, in my last position, I did this or that, but it's, it's, well, in my experience, this broader group of X or Y, we implemented this, type of a solution, this might work here. What do you think about that? So it's kind of that networking uh, approach where just tell me a little bit more about things that I don't necessarily know so that I can figure out what is relevant to, to help solve the problem. I, I solve the problem and advance the mission, I guess, is, is kind of the, the exciting part. Um, and once I have my bearings, I asked even more questions and, and my teammates will definitely say, oh yes, you did definitely ask a lot of questions. But once the comfort level was there, they were more open to share. Um, and so we could together take risks, um, even though we might not necessarily know what was required of the project, but we could then come up with different solutions. So it, it allowed us to really kind of do some out of the box thinking and make connections to assist um, those who are trying to create the solutions and the best outcomes. Um, I do think that um, your industry experience is relevant no matter what that industry is because there's always something that is similar across all um, types of, of challenges that we face. And so I would say just ask a lot of questions, listen and take risks and, and uh, you know, continue to be a team player. That's awesome. Thank you so much. And I want to thank uh, everybody who's uh, contributing in the Q&A, see some lively questions, and we'll try to get to some of them as we move through the latter half of our, our webinar here today. So just like to thank everyone for engaging with us that way as well. I'm going to pivot over to you, Jay, for our next question. Um, and uh, given your former experience as a manager uh, working with employees at uh, all stages of uh, their career, what are the strategies for success that you have seen 
an employee an employee's uh, during uh, an employee's coming into uh, a new company or career during their first uh, one to two years. Sure. So before I answer the question about a new employee coming in and strategies for success, if the questions in the Q&A are too hard, do we have to answer them? No. Okay. Trying to bring some humor into this. No, but in all seriousness, <laughs> um, the number one thing, the number one thing I would recommend to any new hire is to just jump in and be fully engaged right away. Don't, it's, it's sometimes it's easy to, to feel um, kind of relegated to your silo, your, your own little you know role and kind of really hone in on that and focus on that because you're trying to just take that all in. But what I would challenge um, anyone in a new environment to do is um, engage with others outside of your specific area. And, and let me give you an example of what I mean by that. Let's say you're hired as, a, a, a coder. I would I would take a little time to to meet somebody, say in the human resource department, in the marketing department, and in other and get, and get to kind of broaden your scope of the entire um, organization. Um, that's going to build trust when you, and you're going to need it at some time down the road. Quite frankly, you're, you, for what I, I don't know why, I don't know how, but you will. And so. Um, the point is, is that I really think it's important to not just be pigeonholed into your one little role and responsibility, but understand the roles and responsibilities uh, of the broader organization. I think that that will will behoove you quite a bit. Um, and also, I, I would recommend asking for if it's possible to have some type of mentorship program put in place for for a new hire um, and and and. I have seen that's been very successful in my career. Um, com, you know, having a, a new hire work with somebody who's who's seasoned, um, because the seasoned folk, the seasoned individual, will also learn from the new hire because they've got a fresh perspective. Getting back to this is the way we did it here and there and everywhere. But at the same time, the new hire is able to really kind of feel more comfortable in that in, with the relationship that they're able to that he or she is able to to uh, you know engage with that with that mentor. Um, so if you don't have that set up in, in the organization that you're joining, I would recommend that you, you reach out to whomever, you know, within the organization to see if they can implement that. Um, as a manager, I will tell you, I used to have on my desk, a little sign that just said solutions only. What drove me crazy as a manager more than anything else was somebody coming in with a problem to tell me about the problem. Because that's all managers are dealing with all day long are problems. Let's be honest. And I, we know that there's problems. What we want and what we're hiring folks to do is help solve those problems. Now, I, don't ex I didn't expect or don't expect everyone to have the answer to the problem, but at least come in with some thoughts around, hey, this is what I'm observing. And I've had a couple of thoughts, but I don't know if it's the right solution. But I, it... I think it will go very far, and so you will go very far in your career if you come in with that mentality of having, of how to address the problem instead of just bringing it up and just throwing it out there, because that's all we're dealing with on a daily basis. Um, you know, think think about some alternative um, ideas around, um, you know, what the problem is. Um, I, I also want, I, I, I'm jumping around here a little bit, but I saw a couple of Q&A questions come in about, you know, back to the community question about um, if you're younger versus older, which I think coincides with what I'm talking about now, or, hey, I'm an older uh, new employee, or, or I have, uh, my, my supervisor's a lot younger than me, how do I build community with that person, or, you know, I'm, I'm much younger than the rest. I, I, I think if you're doing these things, if you have a ment, if you're a new hire in the first two year or two, and you've got um, a mentor, if regardless of age, you're going to build a relationship with them. If you're engaging and getting out there and and meeting and reaching out to other areas within your workplace, you're going to start creating a sense of community in that regard as well. And if you're coming to your supervisor with a lot of solutions to the problems you're seeing. You will be uh, you will have a very large community behind you. Trust me. <laughs> so, uh, 
So that's my kind of quick kind of thoughts on, um, you know, what uh, strategies for success there could be for somebody coming into a new organization within the first year or two. Yeah, I would agree with you. Mentorship, I think, is critical. And, you know, mentorship can at times evolve into sponsorship to, you know, you go up for that promotion, whether it's within the current organization or another organization. And those mentors could be the ones who sponsor or vouch for you that, yeah, this is a good person for this role because of X, Y, Z and what, you know, the solutions that they pr provided for the organization. Um, so I'm gonna kick to our next uh, question, which is um, for Adrian. Uh, yeah, for Adrian. Uh, we know that some of our audience are looking for that new position. What advice do you have for our audience who are looking for a new, who are looking for new positions as a seasoned professional to get uh, the job? And I know there have been some variations on this question in in the in the Q and A. So I appreciate those. Um, this is one of my favorite questions, I think. Um, well, first, um, when it comes to looking for a new opportunity, it depends on what kind of opportunity we're looking for. In, in some senses, if you're looking for something that's like what you've been doing, um, and, or if you're looking for something that's different than what you've been doing. Um, I know a lot of times, um, you know, we, we get to a certain point in our career where maybe we were really good at something for a very long time and did it very well. And, and we get to a place where we're like, mm, I don't really want to do that anymore. I'd like to try something different. Um, and then, of course, there's the folks who who um, really love whatever it is that they do and they want to continue to do it, but just somewhere else. Um, and, you know, I think the most common tips that I have, um, uh, first of all, um, the, one of the first things is let's start with the application. Um, the one thing that I have um, will uh, advise to any applicant is to make sure that your resume and your application are fluid documents. Um, you don't want to sit and submit the same resume to all 50 jobs that you're applying to over and over and over because odds are those 50 jobs that you're applying to have different job descriptions. They have different requirements. Um, they have different types of experience that they're looking for. And so you want to be able to edit your resume um, and your application to, to support the role that you're applying for. So for example, um, in, uh, you know, let's say, I'll use myself in as, as an example. Let's say the role is looking for five years of full cycle recruitment. Well, I'm going to make sure that my resume reflects the fact that I have 10 years of, of experience in full cycle recruitment. Um, you know, if there are, um, Sometimes this will require a little translating on your behalf as well as maybe the, the way that they phrase things in their job descriptions is, is different than the way that it was a phrase at the company that you worked for. So let's do a little translating here, you know, is, is analyzing, um, it, it, analyzing specific data and presenting to a wide group of people. Is this something that you've done before? Maybe it's just, it's just worded differently in their job description. Language is very, very important because most of the times when you're submitting an application or a resume, the person who's receiving it on the other end is not the hiring manager, especially when you're dealing with the UC system. Likely it's a recruiter and the recruiter's job is to review all these hundreds of applicants that have gone through, compare them against the minimum qualifications for the job and then route the ones that meet those to the hiring manager so they can take a peek at who's applied. If you want to make it to the hiring manager's desk, you want to make sure that your application and your resume meet all those minimum qualifications on each job that you apply to, and then it'll go from there. Um, if you're looking for, if you're looking to kind of change industry, like I'm going to tell you, I was in, in corporate sales before I became a recruiter and I hated it because I didn't like doing um, cold calling. I didn't like walking into a business and asking them to sign a contract for thousands of dollars worth of services. Um, I didn't like calling people and asking them, you know, who do you use for your health and safety trainings and, and things like that, because odds are I'm going to get hung up on and, and it was, I just didn't like it. It wasn't for me. So for me, I had wanted to get out of the sales, but I, but that's all the experience that I had. So I had to find an industry or a role that could use my sales experience to get into that position, but they wouldn't be as heavy on the sales in the day-to-day. -day. 
maybe I could get some additional administrative skills or I could get some additional skills in another area um, that will help me kind of bridge over to the new industry that I wanted to work in. So I got a job in recruiting. <laughs> I worked for a staffing agency and it was maybe, you know, 50% sales, 50% recruitment versus the role where I was 100% sales. And so I was really able to develop my skills in recruiting and interacting with individuals and, and um, advising them on, um, you know, applications, resumes and interviews and things like that with a little less sales. And then, um, you know, my, the heavens opened, my dreams came true. I was offered a position at UC Davis um, doing exactly what I was doing before in recruitment and placement, but there's no sales aspect to this role when it comes to having to build the business because we're an internal department. So through the little the bridging, I used my sales skills and promoted those on my resume to get the job as the recruiter, which was, that's, that's essentially how it worked. And then I was able to phase out of the sales altogether and get into a recruiter position. So um, there's, it depends on where you're at and what you're trying to do. There's a lot of different ways um, to, to get to the end, um, to the, uh, but um, the most important thing that I want folks to carry with them is that that resume and that application should be a fluid document. Um, that's, that's what's really going to help, <laughs> help you see some traction on some of those applications that you're submitting. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I can't agree with you more that your resume should always be up to date and the cover letter needs to fit what you're applying for. Um, but several folks um, have mentioned in the Q&A about asking, when is it time to switch, you know, to look? Can you give us like a little bit on your own personal experience on what, knowing when was the time to switch or, you know, sometimes it's somebody says you should apply or the, the right position comes mm -hmm. along, but ha have there been times in your career where you're like, you're kind of having that that crisis of faith on when you should be looking or, and what have you. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely have been in positions. Um, and I think a lot of us have where, you know, the role that we're in uh, for whatever reason is not working for us anymore. Maybe it's the team dynamic. Uh, maybe the company has taken a, a turn and, uh, but I think we've all been to a place, you know, in our careers where maybe it wasn't the best fit. I know that I had an, a, a negative experience. I wanted to leave. Um, and, um, you know, sometimes uh, when you get into this place where you feel like you're not happy in your role anymore or with the company that you're in, start looking for another job um, when you feel that way, because if one of two things is going to happen, either you're going to get another job, which problem solved, right? Until things start happening over there, um, or you're going to realize how good you really have it. And maybe, um, you know, that the grass isn't always greener on the other side after you go through a few interviews and, and maybe that'll help kind of you reposition your own frame of thinking. Um, there are going to be times where just like with any relationship, when things aren't going well, we think that if we stick around, we can fix it. If I just do this, or if I just did that, or, but at some point you have to decide, um, you know, when is enough enough for you? Uh, you know, if you get to a place where you literally dread going to work every day, it's time to start looking for another position because what's going to happen if you don't is that all of those feelings that you're having, all those negative feelings that you're having through this experience are going to start to be visible to your coworkers and your colleagues. Next thing you know, you're getting counseled on having a negative attitude or not wanting to work with particular people on the team or so forth and so on. Whereas as soon as you start feeling this way, you've got to take action to avoid it being perceived as something different than what it really is. So in that, there's no timeline for that. That's a personal thing. Each person is going to, is, is going to need to determine that for themselves. Yeah. Kind of go with your gut. Uh, Tracy, mm -hmm. do you have anything you want to add on to that question? Um, I, I would say too, just um, I echo um, what Adrian said, and I, I do think that um, sometimes it's also self um, introspection um, and and find, you know, really take that step and say, you know, is it is it really better over here, or is this just something that I need to think about differently, um, or maybe it's just how I'm approaching. The, the challenge or the problem and you know is there a different way to look at it maybe you know maybe you don't have to leave you know but you're just uh you just discover something new and and then it's a personal growth opportunity as opposed to um you know moving on 
Great. Uh, Jay, do you have anything you want to add on to this question about knowing when to, when to, when to leave or when to move on? Yeah. I, and I, uh, I, I might, I might not be the, I, I'm a pretty loyal guy. I, I didn't move around a lot over my 35 years. Um, I basically had two or three jobs, um, quite frankly. And, you know, one of my sayings as a manager was sometimes the grass isn't always greener on the other side. They're just sometimes putting a little more fertilizer on it over there on that other side. So you got to be careful with, you know, with that. Um, I, you know, looking at, I'm scrolling through some of the Q&A and there's, and one of the common themes that I'm seeing with a lot of the questions that are asked much differently than others, but there's a common theme. And, and my response in general is, don't be afraid to communicate to your supervisor what your concerns are if you're having some. Um, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm seeing some comments about, you know, I've, I've, I've got a little bit more of a dominant personality than my boss and how do I manage through that? Or how do I kind of handle, you know, not over committing and, and, you know, taking on too much or whatever. I respected the employees that came up to me and said, hey, boss, this is, you know, I didn't call me boss, but hey, hey, Jay, this is what, you know, this is what's concerning me and I want to talk it through with you. I have... I had a lot of respect for those folks. And there, and there weren't that many of them that did that, but the ones that did, they moved way up in terms of my mind, in terms of what a quality employee that person was. Because I know it's not easy going to a boss and, and sharing a concern or an issue you have with that particular person. And it took me a little bit of, you know, it, 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 it takes a little bit to do that, but I will tell you that, You'll get the response. You'll get your answer. Like, when is it time to leave? If you've got issues at that organization and you were to bring those issues up to your supervisor, you're going to find out real quickly if that's the right organization for you to stay in or leave based on what the responses are, you know, what the responses are. So I, I would urge you to think and take time before you have the meeting to put together a logical kind of um you know, uh, appeal for lack of a better word in terms of what you want to convey and how you want to convey it, be very professional. It's not personal and, and just have all your facts and, and present them in a very professional way. And I think you'll be surprised with the response. It's not going to be what you expect. I can guarantee it. Whether you expect it to be good or bad, it's going to be the opposite probably. So. <laughs> well, thank you all for that. Um, before we uh, really dive into our, our Q&A for the last uh, bit of time we have together, um, do the three of you have any kind of resources or thing, anything to read or podcasts or what have you that are out there that you like to rely on? Um, and we'll kind of circle back to, uh, we'll start with you, Adrian, if you have any kind of resources you want to recommend. I'm horrible. I really don't. I, I'm, I, right. I, you know what? I glean from the experience of the candidates and the employers that we work with. And we are such a busy unit. I mean, we, we receive hundreds of applications for each posting. And so um, I, I like to, I love interviewing. I love taking intake calls from our departments and, and then also troubleshooting the, the challenges that can come up with these matches. And that's usually where I get a lot of my, my advice, my experience from is just gleaning from those experiences. I'm sorry, I'm a horrible right. reader. No, that's all right, no need to be sorry. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll go, to, go to you, Tracy, if you have any kind of recommendations or resources to point uh, to. Absolutely, um, I would say um, I, Unfortunately, and fortunately, uh, for what I do, I am on social a lot. So um, I subscribe to a lot of great feeds um, on, on Instagram, and I love reading um, Harvard Business Review, their Ascend, they have little quick, uh, you know, quotes, sometimes Forbes has some great quotes. It's just those little triggers and reminders um, to, you know, kind of just look at things differently. Um, I listen to a lot of different podcasts. Um, one that I like is uh, Kara Swisher's uh, Pivot. Um, great ways to get ideas to drive creative solutions um, is kind of what I, I take from a lot of those. Um, and then I would say too, um, sometimes delving into what um, my passions are. I love food, love to cook, love to bake. Um, one of my favorite entrepreneurs is, um, uh, Ellen Bennett from, uh, she has an apron company called Headley and Bennett, and she just is a ferocious, awesome person who uh, just is really supportive and has a great 
tribe of people around her. And so I look to her, but also how they're doing what they're doing with their company. And yes, it's, it's a totally different industry, but how can I then take that information that I'm, you know, whether it's an email or whether it's how we're, you know, they're communicating about a new product or whatever, and translate that into how we're engaging with alumni and how, how do we reach a different demographic that we really need to get to for our different numbers. So just kind of piecing everything together and getting inspiration from those um, other sources. Thank you. And then Jay, do you have any uh, resources you want to point to for folks? Yeah, I, I got a gazillion and I, I, I'm, I know we're running short on time. So I, one of the things I would recommend is everybody should Google themselves. Google your name and see what pops <laughs> up. Um, whether you're looking for a job or or whatever, I mean, it's just good to see what your what your um, you know online reputation is. Um, I, I think that's important. Um, I did that every time somebody applied, and I, I was about to interview. I just googled them real quick, and <laughs> sometimes it was pretty enlightening what I would find. Um, uh, I would also you know make sure your LinkedIn is as as was uh, uh, you know from a resource perspective, I would make sure you have a really strong LinkedIn profile. Um, I do as well listen to podcasts. So whatever your kind of passion is, um, play around with a different with a bunch of different podcasts. The ones that might be particular, you know, pertaining to me. I do listen to Pivot, by the way, but um, ones that might pertain to me might not be the most interesting to to everyone else here on the call. Um, and um, I did read a book. Um, they still do. They still make books, don't they? Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, I read a book when I first uh, graduated from from Davis back in the late 80s, and uh, it was called Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, and it was a pretty interesting book. And I'm not one to, you know, I'm a I'm I'm a skeptic in, in, in by nature, but uh, if you're going to read a book, maybe give that one a go. Great, yeah. I I one of my favorite resources that I like to share is a podcast called My Crazy Office. It's by um, two. Uh, executive coaches, and it's really helped me in, in, in dealing with a lot of these different issues that we've talked about. Uh, before we uh, do one last question, given our time uh, from our chat from Matthew, uh, asking about strategies about bandwidth. Um, so it's like maybe 20 seconds each of you uh, start with Adrian and how you kind of manage, you know, work life balance and bandwidth. We have a really small team for the amount of work that we do here at TES. So um, it's we are six total um, headcount, and we provide temporary staff for both UC Davis and UC Davis Health. So both campuses, um, and and out of those six people, three of them are recruiters. So it's um, it's 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 quite a small team. So bandwidth is really important. Um, I find myself providing support to my um, direct reports on a regular basis because sometimes it feels like there's not enough time in the day. Uh, managing bandwidth is really hard given your circumstances. And um, I, for me as a, as a, a supervisor, um, I, my employees are very responsible and accountable. And I think they're really hard on themselves when they're not meeting the expectations or the volume that they know is needed for their role. And so I'm, I come in and try to remind them, you know, it's, the work will be here tomorrow. <laughs> if you don't get it done today, yeah. it's still going to be here tomorrow. You know, I try to provide support. I try to ask how I can help, um, you know, things like that. We, I, I, if there's, I try to keep open lines of communication with my staff because my perspective is if there's something that you need to get to be successful in your role or to get your job done, we need to talk about that. If it's not something that I can provide, then we can compromise, we can negotiate. Well, I can't do that, but I can do this. Um, I think it's really important. Communication is the most important thing. I cannot emphasize that enough because we're not mind readers. So if you have right. a very small staff and they're struggling with managing the, the tasks that are set, you don't know that unless they communicate with that with you. And then when they communicate right. that with you, it's okay, well, where is the challenge? What is it? How can we help and be a listening ear? Listen, listen to what they're saying, uh, repeat it back to me. I mean, these are standard 
active listening skills, listen to what they're saying, repeat it back to make sure that you understand and, and, and try to provide assistance or resources. Now I'm a working manager, so I'm, I'm the type that's going to jump in and do the work and and help. Not everybody is like that. Um, So it's, you know, combating bandwidth is, is, is super challenging. Um, I don't think that there really is a, a specific answer because the dynamics are going to vary. Um, but at the end of the day, communication is one of the most important things in a job. I mean, you have to be able to, to express where you're at and, and what your needs are in order to be successful, to meet the goals of the team. Um, and True. I just hope that you have a supervisor on the other end who's listens and who's willing to work with you and, and, and kind of collaborate on what those things look like to make sure that the team is successful. Totally agree. Tracy, how about you? I I would piggyback on that and say um, that it is difficult, but it just remember it is okay to say, I need more time on this, or I don't have that answer yet. And, um, or I'll get to this tomorrow. I'm just really slammed on X, Y, and Z projects because they, nobody can read your mind. They don't know everything that's on your workload. Uh, um, So if you just share with them, you know, I, I hear you. I understand where things are, um, but I need to have a little bit more time to make that happen. A quick response by email, by Teams, um, you know, we use GroupMe as well. So, you know, even if it's that or a personal, um, you know, text just to say, I hear you. I know that this is important, but I can't get to it right now because I need to go to, I don't know, my daughter's lacrosse game or, you know, whatever it is that personally uh, is involving you. Also, I would say if there are uh, project management tools, we use Asana heavily and it helps to get great insight into um, not only your own personal tasks, but the the department tasks and projects, and then um, the employees and the students that you might have working. So you can kind of take a bigger picture on that and then um, use those tools to help you uh, kind of balance that workload and uh, just step back and also just kind of then having a little fun moment, you know, at a random part of the day or week, um, just to lighten the mood. Thank you. And Jay, I know we're a little over time. Yeah, but Jay, I, any other kind of yeah. I'm I'm not gonna I'm not gonna repeat what um what's been said because it's spot on. I, I do want to point because I I messed up and I hit answer live on a question that was th- that was pertaining to what I previously was talking about regarding online presence. If you don't have any online presence, it's not necessarily a bad thing. In other words, if I were to Google my own name and I saw nothing. I mean, it, 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 it's more about making sure there's nothing negative about you online. And so I want to clarify that. Um, but mm-hmm. I would recommend everyone have a LinkedIn. If you're still working, you should have a LinkedIn. If, even if you're not a fan of social media or what have you, I'm not talking about Facebook or, or Instagram or any, you know, Be Real or any of that stuff. But um, uh, so I just wanted to clarify that uh, piece of it. Well, thank you. Um, I- I know we didn't get to a lot of the questions in the Q&A and there are some really good ones in there. And I think there's some that could be a whole webinar in and of themselves. So look for that in the future uh, in 2023. Uh, On behalf of the University of California, thank you for joining us today for our UC Alumni Career Network webinar. It has been a pleasure uh, to connect with you all virtually and our panelists, each of you, um, we, appreciate you um, taking your lunch hour (laughs) and being a part of your day and this event um, and hope you've all gained uh, a lot of valuable insights and strategies uh, uh, to make your career and life uh, pivots as necessary. Uh, This this webinar will be posted uh, shortly to uh, the UC Alumni Career Network uh, page. So please share with your socials, Facebook, LinkedIn, (laughs) Twitter, and whatnot. Uh, And I personally would like to thank uh, Adrian, Jay, and Tracy uh, for their time uh, today and generosity for supporting the University of California. And thank you all and have a wonderful rest of your day.